Stanford University. Hey, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's certainly a historic time in which electric vehicles are starting to come to market, and there's tremendous interest in this area as car companies actually uh, really have, are embracing this technology and trying to make it work. Um, and you know, probably a lot of you here know that over the next couple of years, we actually have some fairly significant market, first time market launches uh, with some serious money behind it for car companies. So we're, we're going to learn something here. Uh, over the last uh, 20 years, I've been at the Institute for Transportation Studies looking at consumer response to a broad range of technologies, not just electric vehicles. And uh, let's see if I got that. This, uh, I just want to uh, give some acknowledgments to this group. We have this new center formed from the state of California. The, now we call it the PHNEV due to the fact when we started three years ago, uh, plug-in hybrids were really the uh, thing the state of California wanted us to look at. And they weren't even expecting how much activity has happened in electric vehicles over the last couple of years. And now uh, we have broadened our, uh, especially with car companies coming to us and asking us to work with them in this area. Um, just a little bit of history. When we started way back, the Institute of Transportation Studies started looking even at diesel in California. For those of you who remember, diesel is coming to California. And we uh, did a lot of survey work and studied gas stations where they put diesel and who was buying diesels at that time. And I won't talk about that today, but we went through a, sort of a period of natural gas vehicle interest. I actually did work in New Zealand and Canada on this. Uh, speaking, standing around and I'm an anthropologist by training, and my instincts are to talk and observe and uh, be with people who are using these technologies. In uh, New Zealand, after the last uh, big crisis in the, in the 1980s, embarked on a program. They had some natural gas, and they converted a lot of vehicles to natural gas. And so I stood around in natural gas refueling stations for two weeks talking to, uh, to people who pull up and refuel their car about their experience with their vehicle. We started working with electric vehicles in California just a little bit after this with the zero vehicle mandate um, and did a, a series of studies over a four year period uh, to try to help the state of California decide whether there really was a market for these vehicles at the time. Uh, of course, we didn't have very many electric vehicles at that time. Uh, there might be people in here who actually uh, are electric vehicle enthusiasts. I'm kind of curious how many people in the audience here are people who either have owned or drive some sort of electric vehicle. And so we've got a few here. Um, so back in, the, back in 1990, when it started this work, actually, I called up a lot of uh, electric vehicle owners throughout the state who had kits uh, left over from sort of the last oil crisis. Some people had converted their vehicles, a lot of Volkswagen Rabbits and Porsche 911s. And the, there were different vehicles at that time that were being converted to electric vehicles. And talked to those people. And then we did a lot of surveys of Californians. Uh, we come from a travel research background at the Institute, so we're, we spent a lot of time looking at how people drive their current cars, keeping diaries, and now we have GPS to track people so we know just how many miles they drive because it's important for the range. We also did some projects with neighborhood smaller vehicles, both in Davis and other parts of California, and uh, again, lots of interview projects uh, with drivers. Fuel economy decisions, uh, working with the federal government, studying just how people make decisions about buying uh, a car and making a decision about its fuel economy. Uh, fuel cell vehicles, we've done fuel cell vehicles. We, Toyota, we worked with the project with Toyota who actually gave us some fuel cell vehicles. We weren't able to actually get those cars out into actual households, but we did do a lot of test driving with uh, consumers of those uh, fuel cell vehicles, which were quite uh, good Highlanders. And then we went into a series as hybrid vehicles hit the market. We started studying how people, and of course, here in Palo Alto at the center, the Prius Central, really there's so many vehicles on the road, uh, you can't go down the street anywhere in Palo Alto without seeing Priuses now. Um, but we studied, uh, we have interviewed and uh, done studies with a lot of different buyers of those vehicles over the years. A couple of dissertations come out of that. Um, and then we started working with when PHEVs, some, of course, some quite clever engineers were able to uh, change the engineering of high Priuses, take advantage of that system, put a large battery in it, create a plug-in hybrid. 
Um, and we began with the sort of the first 50 drivers of that. We were able to enter the, view them and see how they're using those vehicles and responding to those. We've been doing some national survey work related to that, again, for the government. Um, and then we started in on some new electric vehicle studies with BMW. And going into the future, we'll be working with Nissan and also um, Chrysler, even. It's going to be making a, a, a pickup truck. And we'll also be working with VW in Shanghai. And hopefully, maybe Toyota with some plug-in hybrids here in the near future. So we have a long history of doing these sort of hands-on consumer projects. Just a quick thing about electrics. Here's a whole broad spectrum of products. Back in the 90s, we kind of just thought about battery electric vehicles, uh, sort of a simple type of vehicle. But as over time, with plug-in hybrids, a whole range of products have emerged in this area of electric drive. And I think that there will be more, many, many types of designs. It will not necessarily settle. It looks like, from my standpoint, there's a, sort of a broad market here for electric drive. Um, and the, some people say, which comes first is plug-in hybrid and then electrics, and I think we actually see probably a broadening of the types of products in the market rather than a narrowing and a focusing. But I'm going to, the sort of inspiration for this particular talk today is this comment by a graduate student from Columbia who came and visited Davis and gave a talk at Davis a couple of months ago, and she had this great thing to say. She said, Somebody from the audience said, well, she's studying electric vehicle, and some of you might know, uh, might, might know her, but she's studying social movements behind electric vehicles. She's looking at all the different organizations, grassroots organizations that are underlying, and somebody in the audience said, why, why electric vehicles? What's going on with electric vehicles? And she said, well, nobody ever made a movie about who killed the methanol vehicle. And there's really something sort of interesting there about electric technology, especially when you start working with consumers. And, and I think part of the, my talk today is, is, um, is, what, is uh, what is sort of special about, is there something special about this technology? A lot of people, when you, I've dealt with car companies over the many years, talking to them about our research, uh, uh, explaining what the results of our research. And they go, oh, this, I mean, electric vehicles is just a bunch of crazy people. And they're just over the top. And then you go, well, why, why don't you find this with other technologies? Why is this particular technology, which in many ways is a fairly impractical technology compared to gasoline vehicles. It's a vehicle which has a very limited range, takes some time to charge. Um, it's, it costs a lot of money, the batteries cost. It's fairly impractical. And yet you get this very strong sort of consumer movement. So that's what she's studying. I'm not going to talk too particularly about that today. I think it's a very interesting area that you actually get something of a social movement for a particular technology. So, but, and this particular technology, and why is that? So it's a good, it's, that's a sort of question underlying some of my work now. I've been, since she gave that talk, I've been reviewing my work and like that. Talk a little bit today about the BMW Mini E because we're working with the BMW. They chose us in another university in Germany and another university in in England to work together to, to study with them consumer responses to these vehicles. One thing that stands out, right, is the lease price in the United States. We have this incredibly high monthly one-year lease for a BMW product. Um, there's no public charging system for this vehicle. And there's about 550 of these made by BMW and 450 of them in the US. There's split between Los Angeles and uh, and the New York, New Jersey area where BMW's headquarters are, uh, a bunch of people signed up to, for this one-year lease. They're going to extend this lease uh, for another year. So we've worked with a particular, we have a sample, there's 189 of these vehicles that we're not, that are in private hands, that we're not studying that closely, but we have been doing survey work on them all along with BMW. But we focused more particularly on, because uh, our work is very detailed, we do a lot of, we study the travel of the household, we study where they go, uh, you know, all the other vehicles, how, who drives the car, and then we do long interviews with them and we track them over time. We focused on this small volunteer sample, admittedly. This is a group of volunteers, volunteers who paid $900 a month to drive this vehicle. <laughs> Um, they're largely affluent. That's an easy one, right? $900 a month. There are some people who are really stretching themselves. I've been in some households where uh, 
$900 turns out to be a significant portion of their income, but I was in a, been in a lot of households where $900 is change for the household. Um, Multi-vehicle households, almost every vehicle, there was one household that the electric vehicle was the only vehicle in the household, but most of them have three or four vehicles, oftentimes uh, very expensive vehicles in the driveway brand new. So um, the emphasis on the, sitting in the driveway, not being used, very expensive <coughs> gasoline vehicles, interesting point. Um, mostly men in this study so far, although in some of these cases, admittedly, the, the lease owner is a man, and actually it turns out when we get to their, the interview, uh, it, uh, the woman in the household is driving the vehicle. Some of these people had driven a Mini Cooper before. Half had had hybrid experience. A small number had electric vehicle. These are minimal experiences, though. Uh, some of these people had owned a hybrid. So not big experience, we're not EV1 drivers in this sample of these 54. We don't have anyone who were prior EV owners, uh, people who drove electric vehicles in the 1990s in those. A lot of car aficionados. Uh, when you, I think when you're dealing with BMW, you get a lot of people who really like fast cars, sports cars. They even had three or four households in which they have cars in their driveways that are used for racing. Um, well, how do we... What some of the data this is based on, as I said, we do, we've done phone interviews, we've done some other surveys with BMW, it's sort of an ongoing basis, on, ongoing online surveys to track their use. We do a lot of travel diaries, um, activity space maps, so we know where they use the vehicles and where else they go. Um, and also a lot of these people, you can go see what they're saying because they have a lot of blogs and Facebook. Um, today I'm going to talk about well, how they respond to the feel of the car, the drive, range limits a lot. I'll talk a lot about range, charging times, also the interface, what you know, car companies call the human-machine interface, and then a little bit about the environmental response. What's the environmental? And then a little bit about the market, some broad market statements about the market. Well, this isn't too big a surprise for those of you who drive Mini Coopers in general. People love driving this car. In fact, a lot of the people in this study have not, as you saw, are not Mini Cooper drivers. One of the big surprises for me, although I should have known it coming, is coming into households and finding people in their 50s who are leasing this car and have been driving pretty big, large, expensive sedans, and they're very excited about driving a small, very sporty sedan. They haven't done that in many years, and their children talk them into leasing this car. They wouldn't have done it if their, their adult children hadn't said, you got to get this car. Their kids like Mini Coopers, and so they talked their parents into this. But in previous, we knew from the 1990s that people liked the drive, feel of electric drive vehicles. Um, early on in a drive test in Pasadena, we ran in 1991, we had electric vehicles, some conversions, we have compressed natural gas, we had methanol vehicles, we had a whole bunch of households in Pasadena drive those at the Rose Bowl. We used the Rose Bowl for a week. And they drove all around the Rose Bowl, and lo and behold, the people who drive the natural gas vehicle goes, well, this isn't very interesting. The people who drive the methanol vehicles go, this isn't very interesting. And the people get in these actually very small, very low-powered, DC-motored electric vehicles, drove them around the parking lot, and said, this is a lot of fun. And they, some of them hadn't driven a lot. So that was kind of a you know, first thing. It was my first involvement with electric vehicles at that time, and took noted just this kind of response to the drive field. We also had hyper minis from Nissan, which were a small city electric. Again, people driving this vehicle like that. We heard about people from the 1990s. We heard lots in the press. By the way, a lot of people, there's no data from the 1990s about consumers, right? It's all in the car companies. It's not in the public sector. But now in the BMW Mini project, we get this sort of a, a much more advanced powertrain. It is a conversion. It's not uh, you know, as advanced as some others, but it's very powerful. The car goes as fast as a Cooper S, and so it's very fun to drive power-wise, and so these people love the feel of this car. But more than just the power, there is some uh, electric drive has sort of a special feel to it, and you talk to electric vehicle owners, and they'll tell you about that feel. So there is some response to that. There's some details about that I'll talk about more later. How do people expect to use this? In advance of the study, we asked people, are these people that are really using the vehicle? Uh, this is sort of what the, how many uh, kilometers they expect to drive per week. This is kilometers because um, uh, we were, I gave this talk in Germany and I didn't change this back. So people are expecting to use it. 
This is about a distribution of driving that's very typical for a gasoline vehicle, if you look in transport. So uh, some of these people actually say they're going to make a round trip up to 110 miles. There was a mistake made by BMW at the beginning of this experiment where they told people they were going to get 140 miles of range. There's some errors. I'm not sure if it was metrics to, to miles error, but, but people thought they were going to get 140 miles. They actually get about, and I'll show you in the next slide, this is the range people actually get. Um, under optimal conditions, that means a nice cool day. Uh, they don't have to run the air conditioning or anything else. The distribution of the ranges of the people in our study. Are those actual miles or are those kilometers? These are miles. I'm sorry. These are miles. Okay, so now I'm talking miles. Um, so they're getting, so the biggest lump of them are getting about 100 miles on a good day. You over there to the left, people are in the East Coast who have bad weather are not getting that many miles. In fact, some of them are getting below 70. So uh, on a really cold day, uh, there's issues around heating, uh, uses a lot more energy than air conditioning. Some of the people getting bad mileage in the Los Angeles, somewhere in August, last year, there was sort of a month there where there was some pretty hot weather in Los Angeles and there was some loss, so they weren't getting as good. But for the most part, people count on, in all the interviews I'm hearing, they're counting on 80 to 100 miles, on, and it repeats, it repeats very well for them, very predictable, and they get used to it. I should say something a little bit more about the sample. These are a nice, diverse group of people. I mean, when you, you start into a project like this, you always kind of have stereotypes about who you're going to meet, who are these people. And actually, it's a pretty, pretty diverse group of people um, with diverse driving patterns, diverse <coughs> lifestyles, uh, except they do have a bit of money in this case. Um, OK, how to characterize sort of their, generally their response to range? Well, there's a whole bunch of people in this, and this is not a scientific sample. Remember, these are volunteers. They're nice and diverse, but they're volunteers. But this big group of people for whom this car does not challenge. Their lifestyles are so simple, they drive about 20 to 30 miles a day. Actually, there's a project in Berlin with 40 BMW Mini E's also in Berlin. Sort of, there's a lot of people that seem to have this sort of very routine, short distances every day. They're never challenging the range of the vehicle. In fact, they don't even charge every night. Some people charge every third night. They come home, they don't need to. They know that tomorrow they're only driving 20 miles. The day after that, they're only driving 15 miles. They charge on the third day, about a third of our sample. 100 miles, then there's sort of a, uh, people in the middle for whom it ch the 100 miles is challenged, let's say, once a week, once a month. In those cases, uh, they use their other vehicle, right? So they're simple solutions. There are a small group of people who are challenging the range of that vehicle like several times a week. They're very adventurous. They go out. They don't mind coming home with two, three miles on it at the end of the day. It's very predictable. They can do it day after day, though. The vehicle will predictably have a certain range that they can predict. That's what's for, for these people in this study. I don't know on the East Coast. We haven't been able to do the interviews on the East Coast. But I want to talk about sort of how this works. There's sort of an adaptation going on here. A lot of us, have, when you talk about the market for, say, well, electric vehicles, that's great, but it's probably good for a second vehicle. But when you study this for a few years, you realize it, it's sort of electric vehicles kind of change the driving patterns a little bit in the house. And this has to do somewhat with the way people like driving the vehicle, the fact that it charges at home, um, the cost of electricity, there's a few other things going on. But if you can imagine a household with these two vehicles in their driveway, um, certainly when they first get the electric vehicle, there are certain trips that are taken with car number, you know, this first car number one that now no longer work. You know, they, maybe they go on wine tasting somewhere, they go a couple hundred miles one time a, a month or something. Something doesn't fit, you have to take that away. But People really end up liking driving this vehicle because of the feel of the vehicle. Now, the Mini Cooper, admittedly, in this case, we have people who are on a one-year lease, and so they're motivated maybe to use the vehicle as much as they can. But they start taking away trips from their other vehicle. And so it's very interesting when you see a very expensive, high-priced sedan like a, or a sport utility vehicle sitting in the driveway not being used as much. And it happens a lot in, these, in this study. 
whether, and also their motive. So they're motivated to use this vehicle. They want to, but there are limits to it. So there's some frustration here, too. But people do kind of expand the use of this vehicle. So they rearrange their driving to use it. And in some households, there's a lot of swapping going on because they kind of fight over the vehicle. Some people really want to, you know, and, and I even, one house of my, my, the household I think the most, and this has to do with a Mini Cooper and its power, but uh, somebody uses it all day, the, the vehicle gets used almost 80 miles every day, and at the end of the day it comes home and it gets plugged in, and about 11 at night, the, the husband, who is not the main driver, takes the car out joyriding at 11 every night. So it's really putting on a lot of miles on that vehicle. Um, here's another thing that happens. Because of the range, though, issues, uh, EV drivers are kind of, gasoline drivers, and you start interviewing people about gasoline. Remember the fuel economy study? We asked people how much they drive. It turns out people who are gasoline drivers don't really know exactly how far it is to work in other places. We did a pretty large sample, detailed study. People don't, they didn't get right how far it is to work, how far it is to the bank, all this. Mileage sort of doesn't matter. But in an electric vehicle, it really does matter. I mean, you do have this sort of range limitation, and people are watching their range. I'm not going to use that word range anxiety, because I think it's a complete misnomer for what's going on. I'll talk about that a little more. But people end up learning, you know, oh, it's five miles to work after two or three months of using the vehicle. They know between work and the cleaners, it's two miles, and pretty soon. And then they're also, if they have a challenging day, they're actually using Google Maps, and they're planning. They're doing planning. A lot of these people are planning the next day, more than ever before. So, and for some, and, and actually a large number, some sort of game. I'll, in the middle of the interview, I'll be asked and go, this kind of, tell me more about what you're doing with this. Well, I really like, you know, it's kind of like doing this, I go on. So some people have asked me, is this, are these just kind of crazy innovators again? Are we back to crazy people who are willing to put up with all this? Actually, I don't think so, because some of the people don't, they don't appear to me in sort of other areas that they're doing this sort of thing. So there seems to be something going on, as I said early on, maybe it's the vehicle and not the people. Um, this is an area of research now for, and we have uh, some students working on this. We're very interested in instrumentation. When we did the hybrid studies, we did start to notice when we were interviewing households about their hybrid use, and if, how many Prius drivers in here, kind of hands up. There's, there's some, so when you start driving a Prius, there's this different instrumentation, right, that tells you fuel economy, and people start watching it, and they start paying some attention, at least when you first own the vehicle. So when we were interviewing people, people would start talking to us. I mean, well, the one thing I always tell engineers is, uh, in all the interviews we've held with uh, hybrid owners, nobody's ever opened up the hood of the car to show us the engine. Nobody's ever done that with a hybrid. They're not, they're, they're, there's no attention to what's under the hood. But the instrument panel, the display, is a, something they want to tell you about. And they were going to go sit in the car, and, and they, they actually, they're not mechanic, you know, they're not mechanics. So they, they point, because you take them out to the car to stand around. This is part of the interview process, right? Bring them out to the car, sit in the car, go for a drive, you know, at their field, what do they talk about? And they point at the screen, and they start talking about the car. So, their, how they understand a hybrid vehicle is through that screen. They start telling you these things. Well, this happens and this happens. And so their whole understanding of the vehicle has been communicated to them by Toyota through the screen. So and they start valuing the car that way. Well, it does this, it does that. And they learn their, and so this is Ty's, we have a student who's been working in this area. He's, we developed some new instrumentation for plug-in hybrids to sort of get their response to the use of elect electricity versus gasoline and, and comparison of those two. So we have this sort of new set of instrumentation which has some real-time costs, CO2, tells people how much money they're spending, a whole bunch of stuff. We tried this also with a website, um, although not many people ended up visiting the website, but people do respond a lot to this. And, and Ty's dissertation will be about people's, does this change people's driving is one of the issues. Certainly with hybrid vehicles, it sometimes did change people's driving. So now we're doing this with plug-in hybrids. We have 13 plug-in hybrids at Davis, which we've been using in a, uh, rotating through households every eight weeks um, and studying their use of the vehicle. And all, now we've instrumented these vehicles in a way for them to get a little more feedback. Um, Ty's main thing is he's focusing on goal-directed behavior. And if people, his theory is if people, people set goals in fuel economy and stuff, 
and they'll, they'll, do, they'll behave in a certain way relative to those goals. I just had to put this in because it, it's my only slide that moved. So Mini drivers, the, 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 the instrumentation in the Mini Cooper is not really, I would say, sophisticated EV instrumentation yet. It has a few things that tells, you know, people sort of state of the charge of the battery, can give them miles to go. As I said, it's repeatable. One good thing it seems about this instrumentation, it does seem to repeat for people very well. But it doesn't have a GPS system integrated into it, and, and there's probably a lot of things drivers want. They're telling us they want relative to, this, to GPS. And they also watch the regenerative braking. Regenerative braking turns out to be very important for electric vehicle drivers and hybrid drivers. Although there's not much, there's not much information on board a hybrid vehicle to tell you actually what's going on. It doesn't tell you how much you're getting and under what conditions. But this car does. It has a dial gauge, so it's giving you some at least analog uh, feedback on regenerative braking. But um, well, I, I think I have a slide out of, just a second. No, nope. I missed the slide. Okay, I'm going to go back. Okay, I, I was supposed to be a slide in here on regenerative braking. The way the pedal works, has anybody driven Cooper E, the, the electric one you've driven it? Crazy, right? The, how about the regenerative braking? Did you? Wonderful. wonderful. That's good. And then how, how much did you drive it? Uh, no, 40, 50 miles. Okay, well, that's good. People, if you only drive the thing, a few miles, you'll hate this regenerative braking, which I did. I drove it a few miles, and I just go, this is terrible, because it's so aggressive. It's just like, you let off the accelerator, and, and it goes, the car slows down, you know. So when you first drive it, you stop about 50 feet short of the stop sign, you know. So it's a very aggressive system. And you don't, instead of the, in the hybrid, the, the pedal, the, the regenerative braking is integrated for the Prius, for example, in the brake pedal. So suddenly you have a single pedal system in which energy, you know, you use energy and you regain energy. You use energy, you regain energy. And you're watching this dial on the dash which goes, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> so your, your foot's going up and down like this and people are watching this thing and they're suddenly, and they never use their brake anymore, right? So they stop using the regular brake and they drive under this new regime, this new energy regime. And they like it. And they stop. And they, say they, they don't like going back to their gasoline car after this because of, this is one of the things they don't like. Why the car's sitting in the driveway. They really end up liking this way of controlling energy. They're learning about energy, you know, use energy, regain energy. It's fascinating for them. They don't have any other appliance that works this way where you get the energy back, right? So this is sort of a whole new thing. And I think, and I think there's, we're very interested in the instrumentation about this because there's sort of a learning going on when people use this car. And, and, and there could be a lot, of it, lot more energy, energy learning, which we're always looking for. We're looking for people to learn about. With a gasoline vehicle, you know, you press the gas pedal, you don't know what's going on. Except, you know, if you don't want to look, if you see the gas mileage go up and down radically. But you don't. So th there's some possibilities here for actually educating people about the energy use on board the vehicle. And people, turns out, like it. I think that's what's really interesting here. It's about, so, talk about charging here a little bit more. Um, the whole goal with electric vehicles has been to charge them at night. Electric utilities have excess capacity at night. For the capital uses of that equipment, it makes a lot of sense. It's a big valley. If you look at the valley, you know, electricity, we all know that. You turn off the lights and at night, suddenly there's, there's all this excess energy in, that's not being used. So the whole idea with electric vehicles, everything, oh my gosh, this is great. You charge them at night, and then in the end of the day, you drive around. This will make better use of that capacity. So does this work out? For the most part, yes. In all the different studies we've done, we find for the most part, whether it's plug-in hybrids, electric vehicles, most, something like 90% of the energy use is coming at night. I mean, they, they capture. And you can control the timer so it's sort of in the optimal time. People do for the most part. There are some, some variation we see. For example, Friday nights are a little trouble. People want to come home. They want to charge their vehicle and go out again for dinner. So there's a little bit of Friday night issue. Um, but for the mo and weekends are quite different, quite different patterns. A lot of times on weekend people don't charge. So 
or they charge at funny times, or they come in Friday night they, from a dinner and they race inside and they don't plug in the car or something. I mean, remember, have, people have to plug in the car. So people don't, though, as I said before, necessarily plug in every night. That was one thing. We want them to plug in every night, but they don't necessarily. But there is, people do talk about this getting off, uh, using this system. There's a feeling of independence from gas stations. There might be some rationalization, but this is what we're told from the household. They do like, they think that gas, electricity rates are more stable. Most of the people in this study are not using workplace charging. It's not really available um, because an electric vehicle, these are very, need a high rate of charge, and so they don't have that available at work. It's too slow. There's a few people who do it. But for the most part, this sort of home charging is, do, is working for these people. There's only a few people who need. But there's a big question out there. A lot of people are talking about public charging networks. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of policy around this right now. The US government, uh, foreign governments. I know I'm going, I'm going to be visiting uh, some European planners in the next couple of weeks. And they're really talking about putting in charging networks as a policy measure to encourage this market. And so uh, we're questioning that, trying to understand if that's really considering what we've seen, that most of the energy is really used at home charging at night when we want it. Is it good public policy to put in a large charging network? For one thing, we, the, the BMW drivers in Berlin are not using the public network, which has been put out there right now. We don't see strong use of it. 30 chargers, public chargers put out. Five of those are being used regularly. And those that are being used regularly are being used by the, about five people over and over every day. So there isn't a strong, we don't see a strong need for the network. Previous studies in La Rochelle, Mendrisio in, the, in Europe, studies in the 90s measured this pretty well. And they also said it, saw a similar thing. Public charging infrastructure was not that well used. But we do have fast charging now, and that's sort of something new coming. There were some experiments in the 1990s with fast charging in Sweden a little bit in France, and so it works. It worked with NICADs. It looks like it's going to work with lithium batteries. We don't know fully sure, but it's looking pretty good, and some companies like Nissan are even promoting that. And does this, will this be a big boost to the market? I'm going to say something about environmental attitudes, because <laughs> this is a big shock to our German uh, counterparts. When we started interviewing households, we had a lot of people who were uh, leasing mini E's who not necessarily, they're climate change skeptics. They're not, it's not why they're buying the car. Well, but think about it, we're in LA, and in LA it's air quality. And a lot of these people, whether they're very conservative or not, have watched air quality improve over the last 30 years and approve of air quality management of vehicles in Los Angeles for their children who have asthma or family who have asthma. So air quality trumps climate change for people's views in this, uh, so far in this small sample. There are people, these people think about is they don't know if the battery is good or not. There's lots of uncertainty about electrical impact. Germans, if we're comparing Germans and Americans in this study so far, and this is across our entire sample, um, Germans are a lot more educated about actually the emissions of their power plants. And that's partly because they have in-place programs which let them choose different plans for different times, and so they become educated through making choices about their, uh, their utility bills. But the people in LA we're interviewing don't know much about the emissions of whether if they're Southern California Edison or LA DWP or Pasadena Municipal Utility, they really don't know. And they ask us, and they ask their friends, they ask other people. They don't really know. There is a stronger interest in fuel security in the United States? Yeah. Is there any hypothesis if California were to decouple uh, generation from the retail energy provider like they've done in Texas? Because mm -hmm. it, it seems like Texas consumers are probably closer to Germany because they've got to educate themselves on who to pick. Uh -huh. Is that, have you guys thought about that? Not in the context of this, so I, I haven't really worked on that, no. So I, it, but it's a good question, and, and it'll be, it is interesting that in Germany the choice it, it leads to the education. You know, the education efforts of Southern California Ed Edison, who likes to try to educate their users about their energy mix, which is better than, you know, but utilities don't really compete, and so, you know, the consumers aren't paying that close of attention. 
the sort of last thing here. How big is the market? Well, I'm talk about, go back to the 1990s. We did some pretty extensive survey work on this uh, in California in particular for the Air Resources Board. We did all these drive tests. We studied EV, we tried to understand the problem. You know, I'm not an EV owner, so I, I didn't know that much about it coming from the outside. Um, so we did all these backup studies and we started interviewing California households doing this sort of travel behavior because we wanted people to have an educated answer. There were a lot of studies done, econometric surveys done in the 1990s asking people questions about what they would do, but you might as well be asking people, you know, is it asking people about things they have no experience with. So we tried to figure out some, some methods in which we could get reliable and, and viable answers. I think we, so these are very complicated survey techniques and, and if, it's, if it is, we didn't have vehicles at the time, right? So people hadn't driven these. So now we have cars, we'll get some answers to some of this. Um, some of our assumptions at those times, uh, the biggest assumption that you would probably, everyone's gonna complain about is we, we, we limited the survey to prices which are fairly close to internal combustion engines, comparable vehicles. <coughs> And that certainly won't be the case with electrics early, early in the market. They're going to cost more. At that time, we concluded about a 15% market new cars in California. That were people who were favorably, they were, they were interested in the technology, it fit their lifestyle, it fit their pocketbook. In some way, it, they were a new car buyer. We came up with about 15%. Um, that, now that was a little bit different market. The price of gasoline uh, was about $1.20 a gallon. <laughs> so gasoline was very cheap um, in the 90s. Um, so there wasn't as much interest in electricity for a fuel. Yeah? How frequently do electric engines explode or catch fire? And like once this incident occurs, does that have a horrible backlash against <laughs> Well, we, so I think you mean the looks of the battery is the issue. Um, it would be have a terrible backlash if it happened. Hopefully, uh, you know, manufacturers, I mean, the automobile manufacturer, I mean, Toyota seems to have made some recent errors um, in there. So, so they do make mistakes, and it would have a terrible backlash. I mean, you can imagine if it were the other way, if all vehicles were electric and then we tried gas vehicles and then one of them exploded and burned everybody up who was in their car, it would have a terrible impact on the, the possibility of gasoline vehicles in the future. I think that any new technology faces that barrier. So it's very true that, that, that any, any uh, and probably there's very, there's a lot of worries in the industry about that. Certainly it's happened already in China they're less regulated, uh, small electric battery. Uh, they sort of make these smaller vehicles in China, um, and they're making lots of them right now, thousands, which are sold sort of uh, in competition with uh, small vehicles. People are allowed to drive them without a license. So the license is, is a difficult thing to get, and so they're, uh, they're, they are very popular because of that. So there has been some fires from those, the batteries in those vehicles. I think those were lead acid batteries, though they weren't lithium. Um, so the question with lithium batteries, there has been issues with lithium batteries in the past and they require, uh, people remember laptops uh, getting kind of hot there for a while, a few laptops and cell phones. And so lithium has some problems. Uh, there's some inherently safer lithium technologies, but they're not as good for the vehicles. The car manufacturers are trying to work with the batteries which are very high power they want that power, and those tend to be the ones which have more issues with the, the heat when they're charging. Yeah. Were there any fatalities in China? I don't know. You know, this is just uh, some students of mine work in China, and so they've told me a little bit, driven these vehicles, and, and I don't know if there were any fatalities, but um, there were some battery fires in the public, and the government was got very concerned. What can you say about the situation now with EVs? This was 95, right? Well, okay, that's what my, so my update of this, what's my update of this? I mean, <coughs> electric vehicles are, compared to the study in the 90s, as I said, the price of gasoline uh, is, um, has gone way up by comparison. There's a lot more interest. There's, 
there was absolutely probably, when we interviewed households, people, most of the households we interviewed didn't even know what climate change was. There is some more, there is more interest in that. Um, fuel security uh, had dropped as a concern, certainly has gone up, especially with the spike of prices in 2008. Um, so certainly in the public opinion sphere, there's been some improvements. In the design of vehicles, we have uh, lithium batteries, and that's the big issue. So we, have, we actually have a battery that can power vehicles in this area. The price is still quite high. So what has changed in the market? Uh, we're not, we're probably similar affluence, you know, the number of how fast the market's turning over slowly though now, right? Every time you get a slower turnover in the market, you, you have some problems with, you, or car companies worry about introducing expensive new technologies. But they seem to be racing ahead. I think we're gonna get some very interesting designs and so there'll be a lot of interest. And I would expect for California that this percentage could be higher than it was then. Now, what, there's a big assumption in this, and the, the main assumption in this is that, all, besides the price issue, the big, big assumption in this past study was that um, it was high, what we called hybrid households, sort of before hybrid vehicles really came out that much. We talked about hybrid households, which mean you had a gasoline vehicle and an electric vehicle, and so sort of a, 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 a main hypothesis running through the study was that we would households would not have both electric vehicles. That, so that cuts the market in half, right? So if you make that assumption, minimally, you're, you're reducing your marketplace by 50%. But that's over time. So initially in the market, there could be some pinup demand, what we'd say, because it's the, it's the first vehicle in the household replacing the vehicle. So in the turnover of the fleet, you would actually could get some higher percentages theoretically. But I think price will hold that down for some time. I would, I mean, I'd want to revisit this thing in 2020 pretty closely when, you know, <coughs> people are seeing, seeing lithium battery prices come down some with mass production and such. But um, I should also, so I think I should, I should end it here because I think Sally wanted to, oh, I want to, I'm going to have one more slide, I'm sorry. Um, okay, very positive response to this. There seems to be something, as I was saying before, in response to Shannon Arvisu's um, thing about their, they, don't, they didn't make a movie about methanol, who killed the methanol vehicle. There is something about electric vehicles that seems to, because I've watched people who are not that hot on that technology initially, kind of fall in love with it. You know, there's sort of something talking themselves into it, but there seems to be something about the vehicle which is reinforcing. Something about the drive, the fact that they're quiet, they signify environmental to the driver. Whereas when I put people in compressed natural gas vehicles, ethanol vehicles, uh, a lot of other alternatives, there's, there's no consumer, there's no, in, in marketing parlance, there's sort of no sizzle there for drivers. That they, they want to buy something, they want to get something really in return, not just a different fluid in the tank. So, um, so they're sort of expressive for consumers. And I think that really is driving some of the interest and, and does, does in some cases seem to get people interested in this particular technology and be fairly loyal to it. They remain impractical, <laughs> less practical and expensive compared to their gasoline vehicle. But as I've seen in driveways uh, for the BMW project and other places, you'll see the, a very expensive, you'll see a Porsche Cayenne sitting in the driveway unused and the electric vehicles being used. And the question is, is it just the lease for the year? Will they go back? If they, if they had those two vehicles over three years, would they go back? So what will happen, your question about the market? And, but I'm going to, that's my, I'm going to. Yeah, let's, uh, anyway, thank you. That was good. Sure. <laughs> it happened, and this last, it happened with hybrids, right, in, in Japan. Look at this. I don't know if any of you have seen this chart, but hybrid sales in Japan last April, they got the tax credits, everything right, and suddenly they've been going along, and suddenly they rechanged it, and the market has gone up, unbelievable in Japan for it outsells the U.S. now. So, okay. Okay. Uh, questions. Uh, okay. Where do we want to start? We'll start back. I'm here. interested in the point you made about the driver display and it becoming a game or a way for people to interact with their right. behavior and their economy. I'm wondering if you did a similar sort of fuel economy display 
in a more conventional automobile, whether people would be as interested in proving their fuel economy. We're, we're doing that right now. Because driver yeah. control over that yeah. is an enormous factor. And I'm yeah. curious, yeah. would you find someone who drove the Prius and then driving their other automobile more carefully yeah. or with a different different style? So I'm curious what you think. We're, we're doing that right now. We had to find there's sort of these smaller, there's some fuel economy stuff out there. And so the Department of Energy wanted us to look at that. And so we do have a grant. We're going to do 200 vehicles in the US. And we are instrumenting them with sort of a small display. It's not very light. We have to be really careful because of safety issues in this, right? So people watching this thing is not the best. It's not the best idea. Some people try to talk us out of this experiment, but we are doing that exact experiment starting this this fall. Okay. All right. How about over here? Um, I'm curious, given some of the positive feedback that you got about yeah. people liking being able to charge their home, being independent from gas stations. Um, if you can comment at all on the prospects for a business model more along the lines of better place for right. you know, the battery and people swap that out. Well, my, well, not the swapping. I'm not, I'm not going to comment too much on the swapping. It's a te very technical issue, the swapping. It has to do with cooperation of many automakers and, and standardization, a difficult, difficult issue. Um, so it's being experimented with in Israel, I think, right now, and some other designs, maybe in Japan. So I kind of shy away from that. It's, if, it, if it does work, it sort of, I've seen it with robotics done in, in China with buses, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, but in terms of a business model for charging, my main thing about that business model, as I said, if you have home charging to start with, if the utility owns that, and they've got 90% of that. There's very little energy out there to be captured in that charging network away from home. So how's, how we, how's that going to be built? Who's going to do it and under what circumstances? I did a little estimate. In San Diego, they're going to put in uh, 1,200 public chargers in next year for the Nissan, for 1,000 Nissan vehicles. So they, they're estimating to put in 1,200 chargers and 50 fast chargers in a network over the next 18, well, starting in probably November and then over a 12 to 18 month period. Um, I ran some calculations and, 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 and if, if what I saw from Berlin is true and some other stuff, you could see 700 of those 1,200 chargers not get used. <laughs> and some of them get used, you know, one time a week. Things, so, and then some of them getting used every day all day. So the distribution of the use of those, and so a business model needs to understand how to roll that out. Now you can make, you can probably make money selling charging equipment and having it installed. I'm not sure yet whether you can have a business model and actually developing a network. And in uh, Electricity to France put in chargers for some projects in the 1990s, and uh, the maintenance of the chargers, and the, they put in coin-operated things, I mean, and the, so the transaction costs were really high, admittedly. But just the maintenance and the transaction costs were uh, so exceeded the amount of money from electricity. And, and the people, the main thing that they were valuable for, and this is, I think, the important thing in your business model, is the parking spot. The parking spot is worth <laughs> many times more than the electricity for everyone in every project I've ever seen. If you're charging your vehicle at work, who would pay for that? <laughs> that's that's. I mean, there's no system set up for separating off a meter, right? So the people at work, so it's up between you and your employer. You get it written into when you get your job, you know. You get, I think that I think that's one of the things we're talking about here: the parking spot, because people will go. No, I'm doing something good for transit and emissions and stuff. So you know, give me. And then want, you want a parking lot pretty close to your door, and then if you put a charger there, it's kind of a good reservation system. <coughs> okay. All right. Let's go back over there. Yeah. 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 You seem to be dismissing Tesla out of hand. <laughs> I think that's a big mistake on your part. Uh -huh. uh, the range of the Tesla is significantly greater than anything you put up there. Right. Uh, many Tesla drivers have been got up to 25 miles in the car. Uh -huh. I think you need to take a second look at that. Okay, so Tesla, 
Tesla's built a very interesting car. It's a, as we all know, it's an expensive car. Um, start with a new technology at the high end of the now. The Tesla, as it's designed now, is from talking to people who use the Tesla, for some of the, the customers, it's hard to get in and out of. Doesn't carry a lot of luggage. Um, good car. It's a good, good commuter car if you, you know, it's, but it's like driving a Lotus, right? It's like, it's a Lotus Elise. It's a, it's a race car. Which is, for some people, this is a big bonus. Same with the Mini Cooper, I'll admit. Speed is not a bad attribute of a vehicle for a lot of buyers. Not everyone, although I did have one person, I should say, who refused. He said he's going to turn out his lease because he can't handle the Mini Cooper. Well, I would point out that I don't have mine here today because my wife took it from me to <laughs> So I'm not, I'm not dismissing Tesla. Um, I think... You know, I, you know, historically, I'm, I'm a, I'll have a little bit of wait and see with Tesla because historically it's been a very difficult industry to bust into. Nobody's done it since World War II and who's tried. This is, a, this is an industry which, so as somebody said to me once about Tesla, they said, oh, you know, why, aren't you, why aren't you dismissing? They've got you know, $500 million. You know, and I go, well, that's enough money for a transmission plant, right? For a regular car manufacturer. The, the, Right. So, but the cost of manufacturing and all the, the legal issues involved for, for manufacturers. Look at what Toyota is going through. Tesla faces, uh, you know, a battery. How will they recover from a battery fire? That's, I, I, I admire Tesla. That's a beautiful vehicle. That's a fabulous car and uh, a lot of fun. As a, as a business model, I'm just, I'm just hesitant to, to, to see that it's going to work yet. I think it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Oh, boy, that hands went up there. <laughs> I, I want to, uh, anybody who's uh, willing to look into this, there's a book written in 1999 by Jack Doyle. It's called Taken for a Ride. It gives a lot of perspective on how the auto industry has been absolutely refusing to budge and sure. set up artificial barriers, call them artificial. And that's why it's so difficult to get in and make a new car company, and Tesla, because you get all sorts of kudos for having done just that. They've yeah. also taken a lot of precautions uh, to make sure that battery pack is uh, safe and et right. cetera, because they know that one right. mistake, it's a death knell. Right. Right. The right. book is very interesting because it gives a lot of historical perspective on seat belts, airbags, ABS braking, and the right. whole definition of smog. The subtitle is something to the effect of the politics of air pollution and how automakers have uh, basically derailed an alternative or something like that. Jack Doyle, take it for a ride. Okay, Amazon, that sounds good. good book. Okay, uh, let me see. How about over here? Yeah. I, I was wondering if you comment on hydrogen power plant. Okay, so we have, a, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a technical guy on the hydrogen. Remember, I'm an anthropologist who hangs around engineers a lot. So, I, but I talked to a lot of people, and we did have hydrogen fuel cell, not hydrogen, you mean hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen combustion? Combustion. Combustion, okay. So BMW certainly is the, has been the leader in combustion. Um, Hydrogen combustion vehicles seem to work well. They come back to the same issue I have, which is the refueling infrastructure and providing hydrogen. Uh, I, I have a lot of people who are quite, uh, still believe pretty strongly in hydrogen, and, and the car companies are very strong on hydrogen. You know, they have, they were the ones that really uh, came on strong with hydrogen either for fuel cells or for combustion, and they really, uh, you know, it's, it, the vehicle is wonderful. The vehicle is absolutely works Fine, you know, you can, you can power, uh, you know, we have some issues in storage of hydrogen in garages and things like that. So a lot of our structures, you have to have some, you know, some excellent safety systems involved in people pulling their hydrogen vehicles into their home garage. I mean, but we, we, have, we have natural gas water heaters in our garage. We have other things that are dealing with, with gases. So, um, you know, we, we drive gasoline vehicles into garages, and we're sort of used to that. We don't wa heat our water with gasoline. We could if we got used to it, if we engineered it. So I think that there's hydrogen could serve from the safety standpoint drivers, but I haven't seen a compelling case for the distribution issue yet of hydrogen. So that's why I don't, you know, electricity sort of, from my standpoint, seems kind of easy in some ways. It's difficult in other ways. It seems like it's strange to have all these different distribution systems. Right. 
Natural gas and hydrogen. Right. <laughs> okay, let's take another question. How about way back in the blue? Oh, yeah. yeah, so how much is the highest lease for a Mini Cooper? What's the markup on this? What's the mark on a regular Mini Cooper? Yeah, like what's the lease on that? Uh, 850. What? 850 a month. Yeah, for for which for the highest not not the she doesn't mean the mini e she means the Cooper S. I I actually don't know that number, but it's probably, you know, it's got to be half you know or less. Probably half to less. Probably three hundred fifty four. It's a double lease, basically. Easily. Yeah. They buy it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, another one over here. Did you know any work on the impact that the video here? Drivers might have on peak load and utilities. Because apparently I'm sorry. Everyone's everyone charging. You were saying everyone's charging night when right. they come back from work. Yes. Have you done any work on how utilities might want to change the behavior of drivers before <laughs> smart meters come in and the smart meter comes in? So from behavior. Oh, behavior. Well, there's rates, you know, so there's. There's a, 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 you can meter, it means there are separate metering. There's still several utilities, did this in the 1990s, it's still in place, there are separate meters for the electric vehicle at a separate rate. Um, so you can get an electric vehicle rate, I think, still in, in several of the utility. So there was some attempt to nudge people towards nighttime. Um, and this is a good question. So there's some experimental rates. In San Diego, we will do uh, some experimental rates, distribution among the, the Nissan drivers that are maybe three different rates. You know, as much as, so, so it would be a, the ratio between night and day would be like one to six in one case, one to three in another, and one to two in another rate case, the ratio should. Is it, sure, is it, does this appear to be a big issue for car manufacturers or not really? I don't think they're thinking about it. They're just trying to make the vehicles work. They don't, they don't want to get into too much. They want to keep the whole utility thing as simple as possible. They, they want it to be cheap as possible, electricity, but they would, I think they'd prefer that, I think they would prefer a network be built with low rates all the time to make their car easier to sell. Well, I, I, let me qualify that. I don't think it's payback. People, I've interviewed, people are stopped by an upfront price relative to other prices. There is no calculation of payback. I've never run into a consumer who does it yet, except maybe a few engineers who are thinking about this. Interviewing 60 households in California, I didn't find one household who knew what their annual fuel costs were for their gasoline vehicle. Most people knew what the price of gasoline was at the pump last week. They knew what the last tank of gas was. But nobody knows their annual fuel cost. So there's no payback calculations done, much less discount rates or anything like that. Consumers don't think about that. That's not the way they make decisions. So um, you know, the, for this particular issue, the price, though, does need to be, there does need to be a business model, like is trying to be thought through by Better Place and others, of how to change shift this. I mean, Nissan's thinking about this. So the battery, the idea, do you lease the battery? Uh, the Nissan will not be, battery will not be separated from the vehicle in the United States, but in France it will. There will be a lease price for the, so there's some experiments that will go on in which the, the amortized value of the battery will be amortized over eight years rather than up front. That's, it goes, that takes you a long way towards <laughs> shifting things. Um, so I think that's one of the areas. Probably the most important way to do it is the leasing of the battery. That can only be, I mean, whether a manufacturer will do that has to do with a lot of legal issues. Uh, and so separating the battery. Um, Nissan's actually talking. I think anybody here, when uh, Carlos Ghosn was here, he spoke. And he spoke about that. I think that's probably, to me, the most important uh, business model I've heard on that laid out. So. All right, one more question. Uh, you spoke a little bit about uh, charging stations and how you were saying, I believe, in LA that a lot of them were not going to be used. You thought? I'm saying if they put it into San Diego, okay. if they put in a lot of uh, charging stations, I was trying to estimate based on past behaviors I've seen how much. Uh, that's under some assumptions, right? It's under assumptions of sort of 
You know, it's not, for example, not free electricity in public. Is there uh, some sort of lesson to be drawn from looking at uh, other sort of unique vehicles that have entered the market? I'm thinking particularly of diesel vehicles in the U.S., like Volkswagens. I know when a lot of early Volkswagen diesel owners got there, they like, didn't know where they could get diesel. Right. Is that something you've ever looked at in trying to figure out how people will use public charging? Yeah. Um, electric vehicles are curious. I mean, the, the, the question is whether we can pass some, does the range of the vehicle, you always have to put it in the context with, for most of the people that I'm dealing with anyway of that gasoline vehicle in the driveway, electric vehicle, and they have that choice always. So as people head out from home, what most people tell us, they're not, if there was charging out there, how would they plan their day differently? Well, in most cases, they don't, just don't drive far enough for that to be an issue. So so it's, it's, a, it's sort of a planning horizon issue for some households, whether you would enlarge the market by bringing people in who are more venturous, want to go out there, and go further than the range of the vehicle in order to bring them home to their home charger, which is where they prefer to charge, what they tell me. This is where I, want to, I might want to charge at home. I don't want to sit in some place for two hours or even 30 minutes. So, um, so I, I think what you're getting at is where are the stations, right? So as you venture out in that space, one of the things is as you put that network out there, people, and it seems to be the case in Berlin, people aren't going to use a charger, we see, because they can go home for the most part, unless it's right where they're going. So it needs, so how, what, what's that network look like? That's why fast charging is kind of interesting. It needs to be at their building where they go to work, like the young man was saying. Is it, will it be at work? Will it be where I go? That's what's important to everybody who has the vehicle. If they have to walk a thousand yards from where they charge their vehicle to work, then it's not as practical for them. And you'll find you think the charging stations is really going to be like an interstate highway map? Is that the, one of the big There's some planning going on for that. I, we were involved in, in advising some of that, whether you would put whether you would put these fast charging stations along highways, for example. Will people actually, the Tesla drivers have chargers between here and Los Angeles, some of them go. They, you know, the range on that vehicle is fabulous and they can charge a couple of places and they know where those are. And there's already online services for them. They know where the most electric vehicle owners in this state know where all the chargers are. There's websites that show them where all that is. And you can certainly put that on board the vehicle. Okay, well, I think we need to wrap up, so thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.